The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. I thought we would do a message. I pulled out a message from our archives of our messages that I think is very good to, uh, to reiterate. Um, this is some very powerful principles here. If you'll give me the next about 30 minutes, I want to expound on eight lessons that we can learn from Jesus. I believe Jesus was our greatest example when it comes to prayer. Um, there's behind me, you'll see a, uh, a shelf of books. And there's so many books back there that, uh, that we could expound on and talk about prayer. And I've got many books back there. Uh, but I believe Jesus in the word of God in the New Testament, I believe Jesus set a great example for us um, when it comes to prayer. So again, today, uh, I want to be talking about, uh, we're going to be dealing with eight lessons from Jesus regarding prayer. So if you're just joining me today here on Facebook Live uh, via by, maybe you're watching a rebroadcast of this by YouTube or you're, watch, or you're listening by podcast, we want to welcome all of our audience today. Again, if this is your first time joining us, we welcome you. If you're watching by Facebook Live or by YouTube, I want to encourage you to uh, please let us know below in the comments section where you're from, where you're watching from. And if you're new, just uh, let us know that you're new to the broadcast or you're, this is your first time. Again, we always uh, love to hear you guys uh, and where you're from and get, to, and get to know you a little bit better so that we can interact a little bit better. So, all right, guys, we're going to go into the Word of God. I'm going to start out here in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Uh, this is where I believe it all started with Jesus uh, when the disciples actually came to him, listen what they asked him. Uh, they, here's what it says in Luke 11, verses 1 through 4. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, when he ceased from praying, that one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So we can learn we, we see here from this scripture out of Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, we see here that John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. So John had a prayer life, and he taught his disciples how to pray. So then we know the word of God, it says that John, when John came on the scene, he was baptizing in the river Jordan for the remission of sins, and he prepared the way for Jesus Christ, who would come as the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. This is, if you remember, the scripture said that John pointed to Jesus and he looked at his disciples that were his disciples and he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Uh, as to say, I'm, guys, I am passing the baton. I came and prepared the way, but now it's time for me to get out of the way. So just as I taught you how to pray, he, Jesus, will come along and he's going to begin to teach you uh, new insight, new revelation, new principles on how to pray. So they came to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So he said to them, when you pray, say, and that's a principle in itself as well. You cannot pray without saying. Somebody say that. I cannot pray unless I say. What does that mean? It simply means this. If you want to pray, you've got to open your mouth and you've got to utter words. Words are powerful. And we, when you uh, sit in your chair and you don't utter any words and you just say a bunch of stuff in your head, that is not prayer. That is meditation. You're meditating on the word, but you, uh, all through scripture, you open your mouth when you pray. And he says, here's how we pray. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins. For we also forgive everyone who would sin against us. And I know there's a little bit of different translation here that you're looking at here. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some translations say from the evil one. 
So I want to uh, talk to you here for a second about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, some of you have heard me preach this over the last 10 years or so. Uh, there is six powerful principles just in the Lord's Prayer. I call them the six P's of the Lord's Prayer. And if, when you break down the Lord's Prayer, it talks about praise, purpose, provision, pardon, protection, and power. I should have brought that up on the screen, but I didn't think about it. Let me read that. Uh, let me say that slowly and we'll break this down. Praise, purpose, provision, pardon, protection, and power. Uh, and all of it's there in the Lord's Prayer. He says, uh, he says, when he prays, he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's praise. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's purpose. Give us this day our daily bread. That's provision. Get, uh, and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who would sin against us. That's pardon. And then lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's protection. And then the last part here, I don't know how that got left out, but it is, uh, uh, he, he says, uh, forgive us this day of our daily, uh, forgive us of our sins and we forgive those who would sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and for thine or for thine is the power forever and ever. And that is power. So again, praise, purpose, provision, pardon, protection, and power. So all six of these are in the Lord's Prayer. Everything that we would need when we pray is right there in uh, the Lord's Prayer. So number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus prayed to set the example to us as his disciples and to teach us a pattern of prayer that has six dynamic functions to it. So this is why, and you've heard me say this over the years, this is the prayer pattern that I have always chose to use in my own personal prayer life. Why? Because it's a great pattern and it keeps you on track with all these six dynamic functions. You, when you go, when you start using this as a prayer pattern, you will pray through this every single day when you pray, you'll hit all every one of these dynamic aspects of this. So this is what Jesus taught his disciples. Okay. Again, this is what Jesus taught his disciples. So then uh, I want to bring you over here to number two. Uh, the second lesson that Jesus taught is uh, we're going to find this in Luke chapter one, verses 32 through 37. Luke 31, I'm sorry, 32 through 37. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and that were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. And listen, look at verse 35 right there. And now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. So there is so much meat in this passage of scripture. Now, I'm going to try my best to break this down and show you some stuff here. Notice, number one, Jesus is ministering here. Notice in the evening, he was ministering to the sick, ministering to the demon possessed. He was casting out devils. He was healing the sick, setting the oppressed free. But notice he, what he did early in the morning before the sun rose before everybody got out of bed, before he got his day going, before he ate breakfast, before he did anything, the Bible says he rose early, having risen a long while before daylight. Some scholars put this probably around 3 to 4 a.m. So this a long while, 
It didn't say a short while before the sun came up, which would be if the sun rose at 6 a.m., that would put him getting up about 5 a.m., probably 5, 5.30 a.m. But it says he rose a long while before daylight, insinuating here that it was likely around the fourth watch of the night, which is, again, the Jews brought it up, or even the Romans, they broke it up into four watches. And I don't have time, I don't want to elaborate in there, but there's th there's three hours, three hours, three hours, and three hours. And this is the what's called the fourth watch. And Jesus rose up a long while before daylight. Uh, now, why did he do that? Several reasons. Number one is, I believe, is because distractions. Um, if you, hey, listen, I don't know about you, but if you've got kids like I do, uh, I've got one, I've got my oldest son who likes to sleep long. He likes to sleep in and he takes after me. I like to, listen, I'm a late, I like to stay up late and get up kind of late, run around eight or nine o'clock if I had my choice. But my wife, on the other hand, and my youngest son, Isaac, they are go to bed early and get up real early. So we're talking 6.30 six o'clock in the morning, they're up, they're ready, they're ready to go, they got their day started, and I'm still, I'm like, no, 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 that's not me, that's not my character, that's not my nature, I'm, I, you know, I didn't go to bed till 12 or one o'clock in the morning, I don't want to get up out of bed till eight or eight or nine o'clock, and that's when I get my day started, so this is, there's no condemnation here, I'm not, this is not to condemn you, I'm just letting you know if we are looking to Jesus as our example here, guys, if we're looking to Jesus as our example, uh, I'm going to pull this back out here. If we're looking at Jesus as our example, then I'm just saying here that we cannot argue the point that uh, he was, you know, he's, he stayed up all night and he slept all day. No, no, no. That's not the case at all. In fact, again, he he got up very early in the morning. And again, let me go back to the reason why I believe that is, is there's less distractions. Because if I chose to get up at five o'clock in the morning, if I set my alarm for 5 a.m. in the morning and got up, guess what? Every, my, my wife is already going to be on her way to work, so she's not going to be here. And my two boys will be sleeping. So it's going to be dead quiet in my house. There's not going to be people honking their horns. There's not going to be people, there's not going to be kids playing out in the street. There's not going to be people going down in traffic, going everywhere. There's, the television's not going to be on. The kids are not going to be screaming and hollering at each other. There's not going to be many distractions. So therefore, it's easier to maintain an open transmission of communication with the Father. I hope everybody understands that. So I believe that's why he did that. Because notice it says Simon and those who were with him were searching for him. Where are you at? We're all sleeping in. You're gone. We can't find you. Where have you been? Everybody's looking for you. Okay. And then uh, let me pull up another. I want to pull up something else here. I got some more verses of scripture I want to pull up for you guys. Uh, this is Psalm 63, 1 and Psalms 5, verse 3. Uh, of course, I know this is not Jesus here per se, but you can see the common thread here that we still, the picture that we're still painting here. Listen to what it says. It says, oh God, and this was David speaking. David understood this. He says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And then in Psalms 5, verse 3, David also coined this. He said, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. So long before Jesus became, it took upon flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and it was recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. David understood this principle that I'm sharing with you today. He understood rising up early and praying early and seeking the Lord early. Um, and this, guys, again, I'm going to be the first to tell you this is a very good discipline to have. Um, and I know you say, well, brother, I am a late night person. I get it. 
But you know, can I be honest with you? Even if I, in the days that I, you know, I wake up and I'm kind of droggy and I listen, and maybe you're like me, I'm not a morning person. I get up early and I'm dragging. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. I, the last thing I want to do is be opening in my mouth and, and being hollering and getting into a real, you know, a fervent prayer, um, uh, you know, session. Cause I just, my flesh just really contends with that and fights with that. So a lot of times I'll make an excuse that, well, I'll just pray at night. And then guess what? Distractions, the kids, job, spouse, go here, go do this, dinner, that, this, got to do this, do that. And before you know it, come on, let's be real here. Before you know it, what you intended, your intentions were good, but it just didn't happen. So I have found that if I discipline myself, even if I don't get up at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 5 a.m., as long as we get up in the morning, get awake, man, get you a cup of coffee, take a shower, eat breakfast, whatever you got to do, and you got to get awake. Once you get awake and alert, then get into your prayer time. Amen? So that's what we're talking about here. That's, that's the principle that we uh, want to share with you. Then we go to number three here. We're going to pull up some scripture here. Number three. Uh, so let me go back here. Number, so number two, here was, this is what we learned. The number two principle is Jesus rose early in the morning to pray, likely because it was before the disciples were awake and the multitudes were awake and less distractions to deal with. So then we go to number three. Number three, it says, uh, and I'm going to back up because this is actually found in this verse that we just went to a while ago. So let me pull you back over to Luke 1. 32, uh, but it's actually verse 35. Look at this real quick. Luke 1, 35. I wanted to see, I want to make sure it's, here we go. It's up on the screen right now. Luke 1, 35. Look at this. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, it says, again, we got that principle. Then, but look what it says. He went out and he departed to a solitary place. Somebody say a solitary place. All right. Now I want to go down here to the, to the to Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 16. Luke 5, 12 and 16. As soon as, there we go. And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and he implored him saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then he put out his hand and he touched him saying, I am willing be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged the man to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Now listen to verse 16. So he himself often somebody say he often did this he often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed so i showed you two verses of scripture here and i'm going to show you another one here in just a second here's two two passages of scripture that tells us that jesus often got away in private and solitude by himself. What's the New Testament say in Luke in Matthew chapter 6? When ye pray, go into your secret place. Does it not say that? Go into your closet and pray in secret that your father who hears in secret will reward you openly. All right. Now look at this next passage of scripture. And that's I didn't think it was all going to fit on the screen. Uh let me see what it did. Okay, it only skipped one little part up here at the top. This was hard to get all this. I should have broke this down and made uh, multiple segments, but I know that's really little up there. But all the way up there at the top, uh, right here where my mouse is moving up here at the top, you'll see this. I want to give you this scripture. That's from E.M. Bounds. And this is what he said. He said, prayer is not learned in a classroom, but it's learned in a closet. I love that. Let me say that again. 
Prayer is not learned in a classroom, but it is learned in a closet. It's kind of like swimming. The best, way to, the best way to learn how to swim is just plunge into it and go at it. You know, back in the day, you know, when we were little, it may not be for you and your generation, but I remember when I was growing up and uh, even in my parents when they were growing up, uh, they did things that were so unorthodox and so not politically correct that today they would be considered to be abusers and this. But just to, te the, to teach how to swim, the many times they would take somebody, just throw them in a lake. Now, I'm not saying they would leave them to drown, but they would toss them in there. And this is how they learned to swim. So this is kind of like prayer. You know, get yourself around uh, men and women of God. Get yourself around men and women of God who know how to pray. They know how to touch heaven. They know how to intercede. They know how to seek the face of God. Those are your mentors. Those are your spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. Get around them. Listen to them. Glean from them. Take notes from them. Just sit in the same room with them as they pray. You don't even have to say anything. Just go in there and listen. I've done this many times. This is how I learned how to pray. Not only from Jesus and his principles, but just in when putting these things to action, I would get around men and women of God who knew how to pray. And I would listen to how they pray and how they would intercede and when they did it and how they did it. And this is how I learned. So this is what E.M. Bounds is talking about. You know, we I can get up here all day and just teach from a uh, uh, academic perspective of uh, a classroom setting about prayer. But until you go home and you get in your prayer closet or you get in your secret place and then you open your mouth. Then you begin to pray your petitions, your intercessions, your, your requests, and make your requests be known. That's when things start happening. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 through 37. Uh, let me pull it back up on the screen here. Luke 31, 32 through 37. I know that's really little there. Luke 1, 32 through 37. At evening... When the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And when the whole city was gathered together at the door, then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, this is really the same verse that we just told you earlier from a different angle, from a different gospel writer. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. So here it again, a place of solitude, the wilderness. You'll discover he went up on the mountain to pray. Why? He got alone. He got away from people. Listen, corporate prayer is good, but there has to be a time of the secret place of seeking the will of the Father. Luke 9, 16 through 20. And then he took five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. Notice how, here's another thing I want to point out here too. Notice this sequence of events here. There's a, there is a, uh, there is a principle for why he does this. Notice, you'll notice every time before he goes into solitude that you'll see the miracles. You see, he's casting out devils. He's healing the sick. He's laying hands on them. There's miracles. There's deliverance. And then he goes immediately to the secret place, to prayer. And then what's, what's he do after that? He comes back and he does it all over again. So it's this cycle, praying, De praying for the sick, delivering the oppressed, healing the, the, the oppressors, casting out devils, doing miracles. Then he has, what's he doing? He's pouring out and then he has to go into the secret place to get filled back up. Oh, you, you got to hear me on this one, guys. We can't expect to pour out if we're not willing to take a season of solitude to get, to get filled up. If you want to pour out, 
you got to get filled up. And this is why this is something that Jesus taught us over and over again. Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Say, this is going to be the, listen, if you don't remember anything, remember this. This is very catchy. It rhymes and you'll get this. Ready? Sometimes you got to send them away so that you can pray. Let's say that again. Send them away so that you can pray. Why? Because you cannot be effective in ministry unless you are getting filled up in order to pour out. And this is why you'll see many, 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 listen, can I be honest with you? I have been guilty of this. I want to go pour out, pour out, pour out, pour out, pour out, and not make the time I need to get filled up. P praise, worship, prayer, intercession, meditating on the word, getting in the word. These are ways you fill yourself up. You fill your cup up. So that when you get out of the secret place, out, come on, off the mountain, out of the wilderness, out of the solitude place, out of the closet, then you can go into uh, the marketplace. Then you can go back into the house of God. Then you can go back into the streets. Then you can go back to your families. Then you can go back to your marriage, go back to your family, go back to your workplace. You can go back to that place where people need what's on the inside of you that you have on the inside of you to come out of you, the anointing to break the yoke, to set the oppressed free, come on, to, to deliver them. But if you're not getting in the secret place to get filled up, you won't have anything to give them. I hope that makes sense. All right. So what, are, so number three, Jesus often withdrew himself from the crowds, got alone to get filled up from the father to, 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 uh, uh, to get filled up with the anointing, the presence of just spending that alone, that quality, that intercession time with the Heavenly Father. All right, number four, Jesus was an intercessor and he prayed through until he got a release or a breakthrough. Watch this. Jesus was an intercessor and he prayed through and he prayed to, he got a breakthrough. Now, I know I've got some old timers on here that knows exactly what I'm talking about here. There was a time that, you know, you'd go to church and I'm telling you, you, you came in there oppressed. You came in there with a burden. You came in there with oppression, depression, uh, something on you. Uh, you couldn't get any, it's not like you, you, it's like you couldn't get any breakthrough with it. And you come in there and the old timers would say, it's time to come down here and grab hold of the horns of the altar and don't let go until you get your breakthrough. And I'm telling you, there was some praying mamas and some praying grandmas that would get around you and they would not leave until you got your breakthrough. And Jesus was a great example of this. Listen, look at this. Luke 6, 12 through 16. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now, some of us lost our mind right there. Now, brother, if you think I'm going to pray all night, you got another thing coming. Yeah, and that's... Probably why, listen, if you wonder why, you know, this is the number one question I get asked all the time. Why are we not seeing miracles? Why are we not seeing uh, mighty moves of God and revivals and acts of God and demons cast out and the dead raised and the sick healed? And why are we not seeing these things that we read about in the New Testament or the things that we heard about? Oh, because again, I've said this over and over again. If you want those kind of miracles and you want to see those kind of things, you're going to have to pay the same price that those people that God used to perform those things paid that you are not willing to pay. So here's Jesus. He's continuing all night in prayer. Now, again, there was a time when we had all night prayer meetings. I know uh, many of the mentors that I sat under, the men of God, that I have sat under for years 
will tell you and they'll testify that they've been to camp meetings when they were young, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age. They would go to, uh, they would go to some of their denominational camp meetings and they would go and they would pray all night. They would seek the face of God all night. And many of them through all night prayer meetings is where they got the call of God on their life, where they had a visitation from God, where they had an encounter with God. And some of us, listen, what would happen if we chose one night to shut off all the distractions, shut off the phone, shut off the tablet, shut off the television, shut off all these things, get the word of God, get some prayer uh, uh, some praise music, worship music, and just begin to seek the Father. And we took our watch off. There was no restraints on time. And we just said, you know what? I'm going to seek him until something happens, until the burden breaks, until the depression breaks, until I get the answer, until I get something to happen. What would happen? So it's interesting here in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16, it said he continued Jesus all night in prayer to God. Now look at the next part of this scripture. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them, he chose 12 and he names them. And you know what he did when he chose the 12? The Bible says, and he gave power unto them to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, and do the works of Christ. Notice that all that came to an all-night prayer meeting. What would have happened if Jesus didn't pray all night? I don't know. Would he have had the power to be able to distribute, to, uh, to impart unto them? Would he have chose the 12 people that he shouldn't have ch or should have chose if he wouldn't have prayed all night. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say there's decisions that you and I are going to have in our lives. Are we, are we supposed to move here? Are we supposed to move there? Are we supposed to marry this person? Are we supposed to marry that person? Are we supposed to leave that individual? Are we supposed to stay with that individual? Are we supposed to stay at this church, go to that church, take this position, go to this job, take this place of employment? Am I supposed to, am I supposed to do what the doctor told me to do or do I rely on this? Because many times, listen, doctors have good intentions and they have every good intention, but at the end of the day, they're practicing physicians and they're not the great physician. What they say may be fact but it's not the truth the bible says whose report shall you believe but listen if we're not praying and we're not hearing from heaven then many times we can make a decision out of the flesh and not out of the spirit so this is why it's important the point is here guys is to seek heaven until we hear directly from heaven to make a decision all right now um let me see if I got, yes, I want to pull this up here real quick. Uh, we've got another scripture here. This is Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Listen to this. Uh, actually, let's, that. let me go to the next point because I got that mixed up here. So, all right, so number four, Jesus was an intercessor and he prayed until he got the breakthrough. That's a lesson we learned. Then we have number five, and here's the verse for it right up there on your screen already. Jesus continually sought the will of the Father to be fulfilled in his life. Let me say it again. Jesus continually prayed for the will of his Father to be fulfilled in his life. Now, you can see this. I'm not going to read all this for sake of time today, guys. Matthew 26, 36 through 46, you see the scriptures there. This is a very familiar passage. This is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying, and three times while he was praying, he was in deep intercession. The Bible says that his blood became, or his sweat became great drops of blood. And he prayed three times. Oh, he said, my father, if, it, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he prayed this not once, not twice, but three times. You know what that implies to me, guys? You know how many times, and I'm guilty of this too, 
we will pray something and we don't get an immediate answer. So we just automatically insinuate that, well, you know, I didn't hear a no, so it must be a yes. And we try to help God out and we go ahead and make a decision. When in reality, we already made up our mind before we ever prayed what our decision was going to be. So that when we did pray and we didn't hear an immediate response, we just defaulted to what we wanted the answer to be. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing right there because I know I stepped on some toes right there. But notice Jesus when he prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Now, Jesus could have stopped right there and said, you know what? I didn't hear anything. The father didn't say no. So you know what? I'm not going to go through with it because after all, a no or nothing is not a no. So I'm going to go with that. But then he prayed again, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he didn't hear anything again. Now, how many of you would have, okay, if you didn't pass the first time, what about the second time? We well, you know what? I'm still not hearing anything. So I'm going to go ahead and take that job. I'm going to go ahead and move out of state. I'm going to go ahead and marry that person without seeking wise counsel, without getting to the word, without fasting, without continuing to pray. Huh? Come on, somebody. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about, listen, when we get in the script, when we get into prayer, we have got to make up our mind that we, let me give you a verse of scripture here. We've got to make up our mind that we are going to desire the will of God. Look at this scripture. I want to pull this up here. Ephesians chapter five, verse 17. Ephesians 5, 17. This, the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church of Ephesus. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Did you know there's many things in the word of God that clearly tells us what the will of the Lord is and what it regards to? For it is the will of God that none perish but all come to repentance and the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know right there that it's God's will we don't have to question it. We know that it's God's will for, for you and your whole household to be saved. Huh? Come on. That's what the word of the Lord says. It is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, that's mind-blowing, number one, because nobody talks about sanctification anymore. That, the word sanctify or sanctification means to be set apart for the purpose of God. And it is the will of God for you and I to be sanctified or to be set apart for the will of God. All through scripture, there's passage after passage of scripture where we can learn what the will of God is. It's the will of God this, and it's the will of God for that and this. We don't need to be like, I wonder if it's God's will for this. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked with non-believers. So listen, women, men, whoever you are, if you've got a significant other that you're interested in and they ain't got nothing, they don't want anything to do with you, with your God, sorry. They don't want anything to do with Christ. They don't want to go to the, uh, the, the, they don't want to go to church with you. They don't want to go into service. They don't want to go to prayer. They don't want to pray with you. They don't want to read the word of God with you. They're not interested in the Holy Spirit. They're not interested in the things of God. And you're still wondering, and you're still asking God, Lord, is this the one for me? Seriously? Really? You're really praying that. When the scripture says, be not unequally yoked with non-believers. But you would be shocked at the amount of people that don't know or understand. What, what did he say? Be not unwise. How do, you get, how do you get wisdom? The word of God. Get into the word. Get into the scriptures. Learn the will of God. Now, 
not everything is going to be in there. It's not going to tell you what city you should live in, what kind, what church you should be a part. It tells you what, what kind of church you should be a part of, but it doesn't tell you what church. Is it the first church, church over here, the third church, or the church of this, or the church of that, or the church up city down there, downtown, or, or this, or close to me, or over there, or in this city? That's where you've got to seek the face of God, and he'll show you. He'll give you peace about it. He'll give you a word of confirmation about it. So Jesus was not looking to rebel against the will of the Father. He was looking to embrace the will of the Father. So that's what he taught us in prayer, and that's number five. He continually prayed and sought the will of the Father to be fulfilled in his life. Number six, number six, look at this. Let me pull this up. All right, let me pull up number six here. This is Luke 18, one through eight, one of my favorite passages of scriptures. Luke 18, one through eight. I'm just giving it just a brief second for you guys on Facebook and uh, watching this because there's a little delay here. And then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And he said there was a certain city and a judge, there was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Nor the, uh, and now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me, for my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I don't fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Unless her continual coming to me weary me or wear me out. And then the Lord said, and now he's talking to us, Listen or hear what the unjust judge said and show God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, listen, guys, some of y'all remember I did a whole teaching on this. I took this one passage and we did a 30 minute preaching or 30 minute teaching on just this segment. So I'm not going to break that down exhaustively today for sake of time, but there's some principles that we really need to pull out here. And, uh, and that is the fact that this whole parable dealt with prayer and not losing heart in prayer, but contending in prayer. And notice it was directly connected with, in the, in the last part of that scripture, it says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So watch this. Faithlessness is directly a direct derivative of prayerlessness. I, I want to say that again because I know that was a lot to, to digest right there. Faithlessness. Having no faith, little faith, no faith is a direct derivative of prayerlessness. So no prayer life means no faith. But the good news is the opposite holds here. Where there is much prayer and much contending in prayer, there will be much faith. Oh, come on, somebody. That's good right there. That is, that's what Jesus was teaching us here with the widow woman and the unjust judge. Notice she kept coming to him continually. And the Bible says that even though he didn't fear God, she was wearing him out. And the Lord says, take notice of the unjust or take notice of the widow. Learn what she's doing. Take note of that. Apply that. Well, I don't know if I believe that, brother. Well, look at the scriptures in the New Testament. What does it say? Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. And for he that asketh, seeketh, and he that seeketh shall findeth, and he that knocketh, the door shall be opened unto him. So you can't just ask 
and ask alone. There's going to be times you got to ask and then you got to seek. And then you, there's going to be times you got to ask, you got to seek, and then you got to ask, seek and knock. And so this is what this is talking about. This is the implications here. Again, the thing I really want to get at, this is the thing that really jumped out at me is again, faithlessness is a direct derivative of prayerlessness. So I don't know about you guys, but this is a, uh, if anything, this just really encourages me. I got to keep praying. I got to keep contending. I cannot be weary and well-doing. I don't want to, I don't want to lose heart because if I keep praying, keep contending, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, guess what? The Lord is going to avenge me. He is going to answer me. He is going to, I am going to be found by him. He is going to open the door, though it may tarry. If I be not weary in due season, I shall reap if I faint not. That is what I learned in the sixth principle of what Jesus taught us out of prayer in prayer. And that is Jesus taught us persistence in prayer. Number seven, my goodness, guys, I didn't want to be on here this long. Number, number seven. Let me pull up the scripture for this. Number seven. Uh, and let me give you what it is here. And then I'll read the scripture. Number seven. Before I do that, let me read you some quotes here. Leonard Ravenhill said, a man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by men. I love that. A uh, Corey Tin Boom said, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment or make an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. That was Corey Tin Boom. Here, that brings us to number seven. And that is that Jesus prayed often. I will say it again. Jesus prayed often. Luke 5, 12 through 16, verse, uh, let's just jump down here to verse 16. You can see the passage there. If you want to write it down, you can study it in your own self or your own time. It says that he himself often, often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So how much did he pray? Often. He, he had a continual prayer life. All right. Um. And I wrote down here in my notes, there was a book called In Light of Eternity. And it's the biography of the late great revivalist Leonard Ravenhill. Let me pull this out here, guys. Uh, in the, in, uh, at the end of the book, the biographer writes the following account, quote, he asked Ravenhill in the last year of his life if he had any regrets and his response was, this was Leonard Ravenhill, said, quote, if I had spent more time alone with God rather than preaching and planning how I was going to change the world, I would be a very different man. Now, maybe you don't know who Leonard Ravenhill is, but for him to say that is mind-blowing. That's powerful. So that was, again, that was Leonard Ravenhill. And then that brings me to number eight. Uh, this is our last verses of scripture here guys lit uh verse eight our uh uh our eight principle i'm sorry and that is i'm going to wait till this brings up here on the, the scriptures here so we can get this all right here we go it's going to switch over there it is luke 22 31 through 32 hebrew 7 25 uh whoops that's not it i got the wrong thing up on there hold on guys bear with me there we go luke 22 31 through 32. I want to put this up there so you can read this with me. Hebrews 7, 25. Uh, here's what it says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you or he's desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Listen what Jesus tells Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he also, speaking of Jesus, he is also able to save the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So that brings me to my last point and the last principle 
of eight lessons from Jesus on prayer. And that is this, that not only did Jesus continually pray to the Father, praying for the will of the Father, but he was continually praying for others. He was not selfish. He was not self-centered. He didn't want all the glory to himself. He didn't want all the power to himself. He wasn't seeking recognition for himself. He wasn't seeking his own notoriety. He wasn't seeking his own platform. He was asking to be filled up. He was asking to be empowered so that he could go into the highways and he could go into the byways. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. And aren't you glad to listen? I love that Jesus looked at Peter and he says, Peter, I he says, Satan is desiring to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I don't know about you, but listen, when I when Brother Ricky says, I prayed for you, you, that may make you feel good. If you tell me I prayed for you, Brother Ricky, that makes me feel good. But how would you like to how would you like to know that Jesus comes to you and says, I have prayed for you, that your faith will withstand the trials and the temptations of the evil one? Man, how would that make you feel? Well, you say, well, Brother Ricky, that would make me feel great. Well, I got news for you. That wasn't just for Peter. According to Hebrews 7, 25, do you know where Jesus is right now, present tense? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for you and I. Do you know what that means in layman's terms? That means that Jesus is praying for you and you and you and me. He, everyone under the sound of my voice on podcasts, on YouTube, on Facebook, he is praying for us. Uh, there, there's been times when you should have died in a car accident, but Jesus was praying for you. There was times when you could have died in, in a drug deal that, would, would, that was going to go wrong. And there was nobody out there to pray for you, but Jesus stepped in and prayed for you. There was a time when you should have gone out a long time ago, but Jesus stepped in the middle of your circumstance because he prayed for you. He pray when you thought you were going to throw in the towel, give up, call it quits, just walk away from everything, Jesus was praying for you behind the scenes and you didn't know it. You were not aware. And it's like the next morning you woke up and you can't explain it, but it was almost like the burden was lifted. Oppression was lifted off of you. You felt excited. You felt like you had purpose all of a sudden. And you're like, I don't know why I even feel like this. I didn't even pray last night. I didn't go to church last night. I didn't read the Bible. I've been running away from God. I've got an answer for you. It's because while you were sleeping, and, and your rebellion and running away from God, Jesus was interceding and praying for you. I'm telling. Listen, I told people, and I'm going to close with this, guys. I told people all the time. I tell people this: if you're going to run away from God, you're going to have to go through a lot of red tape. You're going to have to go through a lot of roadblocks. You're going to have to go through a lot of detours. You're going to have to go through angels. You're going to have to go through praying grandmothers. You're going to have to go through some praying evangelists, some pastors, some people that, that know you. I'm telling you, you're going to have to go through a whole lot to run from God. Because my Bible says that David got a revelation one time. And he says, where can I go from the presence of the Lord? If I go to the bottom of the ocean, he's there. If I go to the heights of heaven, he's there. If I make my abode in hell, he is there. You can't run from God. He's going to find you. He's going to seek you out. Why? Because he wants to torment you? No, because he loves you and he has a plan and he has a purpose and he has a destiny for you and for me and for all those who are willing to yield to his marvelous plan for the life. Endtimeheadlines.org, endtimeheadlines.com. We're getting ready to pray, guys. But bear with me for just a second. Uh, I want to share just a few things with you real quick. Uh, 
some information about our ministry that I want you to know about. Again, if you're watching by Facebook Live or by YouTube, we have a podcast. Uh, this message right here will be uploaded and it'll be put on our podcast and it'll be, uh, you can listen to it um, and it's free. You can go to Apple, you can go to Android, or you can go to our main website, endtimeheadlines.org. Either one of those three locations and you can listen, or four actually, the app too. And that brings me to the next point. Um, again, the podcast is free. And then I, I implore you, I, wanna, I want to challenge you to please, if you've not done it yet, go to the app store. If you've got Google, you've got Android, you're watching by YouTube, watching by Facebook, it's free. There's no cost to it. Go and download our official ETH app. Why? Because number one, you're going to get push notifications for all of our breaking news and headlines from a prophetic perspective. You're going to get our, when, whenever we upload our new podcast, our YouTube message, it's going to alert you to let you know we've got a new message up. And, and lastly, because you cannot rely on Facebook because uh, we get, we've been flagged. We've been marked just yesterday i got our eth facebook page got flagged again and i'm going to talk more about that tomorrow we're going to do a whole segment i'm going to talk about uh, uh we're going to talk about china we're going to talk about digital surveillance and i'm going to i'm going to show you something goofy that happened to us on our facebook page to show you how ridiculous this is getting okay i'm going to show you how ridiculous all this is getting so again please go download our app you guys watching by or listening to my podcast, get our app, ETH app, End Time Headlines. Just go to the app store on Apple or Android. You, you'll find it. Um, again, if you would, uh, as always, we want to encourage you, if you've not yet uh, prayed about being a supporter of our ministry, we want to give you that opportunity. You can be a one-time, maybe you want to just sell a one-time gift as a thank you and as appreciation, or you want to be a monthly partner. You want to partner with us and help us to get the word out. Again, it's it's uh, we don't uh, we don't charge for anything. The podcasts are free, the apps free, the newsletters free, the subscription. There's no subscription fee. The messages are free. There's no uh, there's no CDs, no DVDs. There's no apps. Everything's absolutely free. All we ask is that if the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart, if you're blessed by this word. Uh, by this ministry, you're encouraged, you're edified, you're informed weekly, and you want to help partner with us, and you you stand behind our mission and what we do. We want to give you that opportunity, and of course, the scripture says, if you as when as you give, it shall be given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So we want to pray for you real quick. Again, we're getting ready to sign off after this prayer, but we will be back on here tomorrow. We're going to do our, our viewpoint segment. We're going to talk about some crazy stuff going on. And then next week, we're going to finish up our four-part series on the book of Revelation chapter 13. We're going to be dealing with the mark of the beast, so you don't want to miss that. So let's pray real fast. Father, I thank you for those that are listening by podcast today, watching by YouTube, watching by Facebook. Father, I pray, Lord, I include myself in this prayer, God. Lord, I'm asking that you would teach us and help us all to become better in our prayer life. Lord, help us to, to implement these disciplinary measures. God, help us to set a time to pray. Help us to pray unto you more often. Lord, help us to set a solitude place, a, a place of prayer, a time of prayer. Lord, let us seek your face. Let us intercede. Let us pray. Let us go to that place where we can get filled up so that we can come out of that place and be empowered to go into our lives and go into, into the people's lives that you have in our proximity that need to be impacted by the gospel and by the power of God and help us to be effective in their lives. And we know that we cannot be more effective than our prayer life. And we ask that, Father, you would give us the strength to do that. Give us that willpower to do it. Lord, give us a hunger. Impart in us a hunger to pray and seek your face like never before. Lord, I pray there'd be an unction to pray, an anointing to pray. 
Help us to seek your face. Lord, if we've not been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I pray it would come through our personal prayer time and that he, when he, the, that when that, when that, when the comforter comes, when we're, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we can pray in the Spirit and build ourselves up like the book of Jude says, praying in the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would teach us, empower us, equip us to do that which you have instructed us and that you've laid out before us to, as an example to us to do. And we thank you for these things. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. All right, guys, God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. We hope that today's word was a source of blessing and encouragement to you and your family. End Time Headlines is a ministry that provides weekly teachings to equip believers and inform the discerning of the signs and seasons in which we are in. If you would like to help support this ministry with a gift of any amount, you can do so electronically by visiting our website at endtimeheadlines.org, where you can sow a one-time gift or set up monthly partnership. If you would like to give by check or money order, you can do so by writing to End Time Headlines, P.O. Box 2312, Clarksville, Indiana, 47131. Thank you for your generous support and partnership to End Time Headlines. <music>